Welcome to the NWAETC Project ECHO. I'm Kent Unruh, and I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Brian Wood, our medical director, to introduce our guest. Well, our remote speaker, I think, is familiar to most people on our ECHO network. Dave Hatchie is a member of our expert panel and is professor of pharmacy at Idaho State University. And he's going to share some of his experience today in terms of treating hepatitis C and setting up a hepatitis C treatment uh, clinic at his facility. So, Dave, I'll just turn it over to you. Absolutely. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Ken. And the objectives that I want to uh, get across to everybody today is just to first understand different models uh, of including hepatitis C care into HIV. Uh, I think that uh, a common mantra amongst HIV providers, at least, you know, pre, uh, pre new drug therapy has been, we can't do hepatitis C. It's too complex. It's all these other things. And so, I want to explore different um, models that uh, may fit your program or that you can explore. Uh, secondarily, I think when we look at hepatitis C and we begin to get a bit more overwhelmed sometimes, uh, I think HIV providers are very well placed at treating hepatitis C because of all the parallels that we see uh, between the two disease states and the two care systems. And, and so today we're actually going to look more system-based um, approaches to care rather than um, the actual types of therapies and so forth. And then lastly, just uh, uh, I wanted to bring a case from our clinic. This is our most recent patient that uh, came to our clinic that I wanted to present and, and, and uh, share just some of our, our experience. Uh, I just want to talk about some of these models of care and uh, look at the spectrums based on the resources in your community. And, and we were lucky enough a few years ago to participate in a, uh, um, a SPINS project through HRSA that looked at these different models of integrating hepatitis C care into uh, HIV-funded programs or Ryan White clinics. And when you look at these different types of models, they're kind of on a spectrum, if you will. And uh, take the first, uh, first model is, uh, is identified as a primary care management with expert backup. And this is a model that fits, um, fits our clinic. And this model is where we don't have really any resources that are specific to um, the care of, uh, of a hep C patient in our community. We don't have a hepatologist. We don't have a lot of good substance abuse uh, providers or access to psychiatry. And so this model usually um, uses the HIV primary care providers as um, the management and as the managers of the hepatitis C care, but collaborates with various specialists, whether it's um, a community specialists, uh, you know, like maybe a quick referral and evaluation by a, a gastroenterologist to screen for other problems or conditions. But we've used the ECHO model as our quote unquote specialty backup where all of our co-infected patients are presented to the uh, ECHO panel for discussion, evaluation, guidance, uh, and, and, and treatment follow-up. So using the ECHO model in this has, uh, uh, has proven to be beneficial. I think also the data that has come from the ECHO studies uh, showing that uh, remote management uh, who uh, manage patients is just as effective as, as specialty care. On the other end of the spectrum, if the clinic that you work in also has uh, either a gastroenterologist or a hepatologist that has a hepatitis C clinic, this is generally where the HIV program uh, refers the patient over to hepatology and then kind of uh, manages them, uh, you know, or co-manages them and, and has that close contact, if you will. Uh, and then the third type of model is more of a uh, a hybrid of those in which uh, an HIV program may uh, bring in or pay a hepatologist or a specialty uh, hep C provider to come in once a week or twice a month or even once a month to run a quote-unquote co-infection clinic. And this is where you generally see a team of providers brought in to, uh, to again, support that, that patient through their therapy. And I think highlighting some of these parallels with, with HIV care may alleviate some anxiety that, that providers may have of, 
of really diving into this disease. And, and the first thing is uh, uh, that's shown successful programs, both on the HIV and Hep C front, is having sort of this program champion or some dedicated provider. And this doesn't have to be a physician per se. Uh, again, I think of uh, uh, Montana's program with, uh, uh, with Jesse up there. I know he's very active and has been sort of uh, an anchor within their program. And, and I, I just look at other programs that, that uh, have either a nurse and in, in, in our clinic, you know, myself as one of the pharmacists, where you're sort of, uh, you know, rooted in the, in the patient's interest, if you will and really looking at driving the program. The other aspect is the ongoing evaluation of treatment candidacy. Now you may have an HIV patient that comes in that has you know, active mental health or um, insurance issues or, or other adherence problems, but you're still going to be screening and educating and having ongoing um, evaluation. And, and the question that has to be asked is how does your program ensure that your HIV patients uh, are being screened for hep C at least once or ongoing if there's continued high-risk activity. Uh, and then the, the, I think the more important question is once identified as positive, how are the patients in your clinic being deemed to be eligible for, for treatment? So how are you identifying barriers to care? Um, what is going on into the um, education and evaluation of the patients uh, in, in that aspect? And the thing that really, I think, supports, uh, supports the uh, decision-based care <laughs> are treatment protocols. Uh, again, we all, I think, rely on DHHS protocols and, and guidance for how often we're doing uh, you know, labs or what drugs we're using first line, et cetera. So within your program, having whether they're EMR templates, and I know Matt Messerschmidt in, in Boise, uh, you know, over the last year created a wonderful uh, checklist within their uh, EMR that, uh, that helped sort of the, the provider go through that, that checklist of uh, hep C-related um, uh, hep C-related needs. Also, having things such as uh, having things such as treatment calendars, having things such as uh, paper flow charts, dosing protocols, all those things that, that help coordinate, uh, coordinate the care. Then I think probably the most important uh, key feature is patient education. Uh, patients need to understand that this is curable, that, um, that uh, you know, things they can do for risk reduction, uh, you know, clean needles use, condom use, uh, alcohol reduction, all these things uh, about, you know, getting involved, understanding the, the care that goes into uh, uh, being treated for hepatitis C, uh, what the treatment course actually looks like, uh, and then tying that into the client support groups of, of if your community has uh, the resources for uh, support groups of of getting them more education and, and counseling, if you will. Now, the, the next two points about um, access to psychiatry and mental health services, so same parallel with, with HIV patients. If there's ongoing um, untreated mental health concerns or substance abuse, it's going to complicate and make your HIV care uh, you know, less successful. And it's the same thing with hepatitis C care is that if they're not getting that supportive service or have access to that, then it's going to be more difficult for them to have successful outcomes. And again, this is where Project ECHO on Tuesdays has really come to the support of, of uh, providing those services. And then accessing things like um, medication patient assistance programs, uh, uh, insurance coverage, jumping through those hoops, uh, is, again, very, you know, strong parallels between the HIV and, and, uh, uh, and Hep C. All, although HIV has more access through, like, state ADAP programs, uh, the Hepatitis C certainly has uh, options and, and opportunities with patient assistance and, and uh, um, other support programs. And then lastly is the disease state monitoring, uh, making sure we're getting good follow-up with patients, uh, having the routine labs, and again, treatment calendars, as we'll see here uh, shortly, can certainly support that. Next slide. I'd like to look at a case and, and uh, get everybody's thoughts. This is a gentleman that uh, 
um, came to our clinic, and I and, uh, just want to see if this gentleman uh, showed up to your clinic. Uh, he was a transfer patient, 34-year-old Caucasian male, diagnosed with HIV in 2007, uh, history of Kaposi sarcoma, syphilis, mild depression, hepatitis C. He missed a 500-plus lifetime partners. Uh, he states he did have a biopsy um, as last provider and uh, revealed some scarring, but we don't have prior records, so not sure stage and grade. Uh, he had an active uh, methamphetamine addiction, had inpatient treatment in the spring of 2000, 2013, has had a couple subsequent relapses, primarily because of boredom and loneliness, um, and his most recent use was in the past 30 days. Uh, he is an intelligent uh, uh, and accomplished individual. He has a BS in microbiology, two master's degree in theology, psychology. He is a retired priest uh, and looking at getting into a PhD program, but currently unemployed, uninsured, and lives at home with his parents. And uh, he was on a triple in 2007, switched to his current regimen by his past provider to Kalitra Truvada Icentris in preparation for one of the past um, direct acting anti, um, antivirals. Uh, he states he has impeccable adherence even when he was using methamphetamine and he has the documented uh, continuous viral suppression to, to support that. His current labs, he's got a CD4 count of 500, viral load of less than 20, genotype 1A, uh, 1 1.5 million. Uh, he's hep B negative and you can see some of his important hep C markers there of uh, elevated AST and L ALT. Uh, albumin, total billy is a little bit elevated, H&H uh, &H is normal, platelets uh, borderline, INR is normal, and TSH uh, normal. So have an audience response slide. I want to know what you would do with this patient who walks into your clinic who's basically already been prepped for hepatitis C therapy by his past provider. Um, would you initiate therapy immediately? Uh, would you wait until he's abstinent from methamphetamine for at least six months, given the fact that he has, uh, he's had recent use. Would you repeat his biopsy or would you send him off for mental health and substance abuse while working up his hep C? Uh, we actually presented this patient um, to the ECHO network and kind of had a split decision and I'll get to that in a second, but uh, I wanted to give a couple tools and I know I'm running short on time, but these are a couple tools that we use to help keep us in check and where we are with our um, uh, our sort of role with our patient is once somebody's had an antibody test that's come back positive and they have a positive reflex to genotype, we get their viral load, um, we get their genotype, they actually go through a whole pretreatment screening process where they meet with their medical provider, uh, they get uh, worked up, presented to ECHO, uh, they go through the, the, the routine labs, the physical exam, the education, do you want therapy, do you not want therapy? We have had some patients that just back off and say, I don't want to go through it, I don't want to worry about it. So it's, it's really gauging interest and, um, and uh, sort of candidacy, if you will. Then they also have an appointment with our pharmacist. They receive some education, they do evaluation of insurance, uh, patient assistance work, they get tied into all of that. And again, they're, then they're presented to ECHO, and that kind of goes back and forth. If ECHO says, you know what, then they're not quite ready, do some of these things, then they go back into the clinic with their uh, provider or the pharmacist, get that wrapped back up, and then get presented to ECHO. And then this is just an example of a treatment calendar. So when a patient is deemed to be a candidate, we fill in everything from uh, what day they're getting drawn of the week, their injection day if they're on interferon, the day they're starting, the length of therapy, um, putting their meds with their doses, the dates of their labs, um, their appointment dates, what labs they need. And then the patient gets one of these. We tell them to stick it on their fridge and put it, the dates in their iPhone or their uh, phone to, so that they know when to come in. The lab gets a copy of this as sort of their quote unquote standing orders for lab draws. Uh, one goes into their chart so that all the patients know uh, and all the providers know when patients are due for certain things. This patient that we had um, highlights a lot of uh, challenges. Uh, first of all, when we did present this patient to ECHO, there was a bit of a split decision, again, like I said, um, partly because of his active substance abuse. And again, that's a bit of a public health concern. Do you, do you, present, do you, do you treat somebody that may have uh, risk for reinfection? Um, do you not? Do you cure him so that if he does expose somebody else, then you know he's cleared? 
but the patient did agree to the following terms. Again, we kind of do an inf uh, informed consent where patients agree to their uh, treatment. So he started mirtazapine for depression and reduced meth use. He comes to clinic weekly for his injections of his interferon. Uh, he's agreed to random drug screens uh, with potentially withholding therapy if he comes back positive. He has weekly counseling. Uh, he's had uh, complications from his interferon. He's had an ANC that's dropped. And again, you, there's no perfect patient. And I know a lot of people wait for that perfect patient. There's not going to be one. Um, so just pick one that you think you can work with and, and kind of go from there. Take questions.